Thank you, Janet, and uh, thank all of you for joining us. So, Super Bowl 43, 2009. Pittsburgh Steelers won with the help of Heinz Ward, who interestingly, right before the game, got an MCL tear, which was treated with platelet-rich plasma. And among hundreds of other stories since then and currently, that got everybody interested in the potential for what biologics can offer. So you look at what advertising has come by, and we see that once Google and the FDA steps in, we really have gotten into an information overload situation. If you Google these terms, look at how many citations we have. So today is gonna to be a bit like taking a drink out of a, out of a, um, uh, a very high powered water fountain, right? fire hydrant. We can see that from a business perspective, the stem cell market is gonna be up to $13 billion by 2026. So there's a lot of hype. And the fact still remains that there are no pharmaceutical projects that can stop the halt of OA. Yet, if you look at this study that was done in the public, over 50% of people think that stem cells can cure arthritis. And 64% said they would consider therapies if the doctor recommends it, even if there is not evidence. So this is a problem. So if we start with the question is, what is a biologic? That would be a good place to start. And a biologic is any type of medical therapy that's coming from a living organism. And today we're gonna really look at that in the context of humans. There are a lot of terms you'll see thrown around and this can be very confusing, but there are many medical conditions that can be treated. What we're going to discuss are the two at the top, which are really blood products, stem cell therapies. Why should you care about this? How is this even gonna help you? And to answer that, we should really start from the most basic element of all of us. We are all made of cells. That is the basic ingredient. And these cells go together to form organ systems. But even that is too simple because when we have a problem, very often there are multiple elements involved. So one of the key concepts that I want to transmit is our body is a very highly sophisticated sensing and signaling machines, always looking. And we hear a lot about hormones, which can communicate with the organs right next to each other when it's within itself and then further downstream. All of these go together to form what we call the micro environment. That is the environment right around the cells where all the communication and the signaling is happening. And this is constantly changing. So it's important to recognize that there is a constant balance of breakdown and growth. And when things go right, all the cells are communicating with each other and active input is being obtained. So what does this all boil down to? Health span, lifespan, what really matters is what does it mean to you? It's been my observation that as we begin life, we don't really care, we do what we want. And then as we go through life somewhere in the middle, we start to care. And so what happens when this occurs? Well, everything starts to fail. Signals don't happen. Genetic information gets lost. The systems don't really run. And as I often say every day is, things will always fail in autopilot. This looks different for each person. And this is what I see around me. A lot of times everyone's doing things, they don't know why they're doing it. And I think ultimately part of my role here today is to help everyone just consider. And others have said before me, if our body and brain are a company and we are the CEOs, how do you wanna run your company? And we can double click on this idea of aging here and we can look at all of the details of what actually happens when we age. All of this summarizes into things break down. And we often see this abnormal immune system activation. So our immune system starts to attack itself. And when that gets out of control, then ultimately we develop joint wear, we develop pain, we stop moving, everything becomes deprogrammed and there's too much noise and everything goes wrong. Everybody's a little bit different. We all know somebody who's in their 90s and they've done all the wrong things and they're doing just fine. And so it's a combination of our environment as well as genetics and time. So everybody is a little bit different. There are some assumptions I wanna to make today. The first one is the body is the most advanced piece of hardware that we're ever gonna own. There are no shortcuts to optimal health. 
And each person is an individual. Even though I'm going to give you a lot of statistics, each person is an individual, not that statistic. And they're not one size fits all formulas. So I always get concerned when we look at the media and everyone tells you to do one thing or the other. So if we look at the landscape that we're in, this is what we see strewn about. Facts, emotions, opinion, advice, experience. What I'm going to attempt to do today is to interpret as I see what is happening right now. As I said, it's like drinking from a fire hydrant. So I'm gonna to attempt to communicate where are we today when it comes to how biologics may relate to the uh, options that we have. So let's start with the biggest uh, problems that at least I see as an orthopedic surgeon. If you look at the data I presented here, by 2050, the UN is predicting 40 million people around the world will be severely disabled by osteoarthritis. I'm gonna use the uh, the, the word OA during this talk. And what that means is a chronic joint disease where the joint deteriorates. And often we see that as stiffness, pain, and impaired movement. If we don't look at what causes this, we're not gonna really be able to understand what the solutions are. So I have used this admittedly oversimplified uh, analogy here where we're looking at how we build a house. And these are the must haves if you're looking at how tissues need to grow. The cells are the building blocks of the house. The growth factors are the people building the house. They're talking to each other to make sure everything is organized. And the scaffold is the foundation of the house. Now, one thing that doesn't fit in here is we need mechanical stimulation. If I want to get my joints better, I need to put some stress on them. So if we look at this model of a knee joint, you have bone on each side, you have cartilage, and you have these bearing structures in between. The shoulder has a similar uh, makeup. And then we have muscles and tendons that attach to these things. All of these areas can break down. Here is a photo of an arthroscopic view of a meniscus. And you see this is perfect cartilage on both sides. And then if we look at this next slide here, look on the left and you'll see a perfect joint with a meniscus tear. And on the right, you see a very arthritic joint with a meniscus tear. Tear. So a meniscus tear is not a meniscus tear. The context needs to be understood or we will miss the point. And you can see this over here too. This is what bone on bone looks like. So addressing a meniscus tear in this situation is not the same as addressing this over here. The biology is completely different. So let's take a model of an injury. You fall down, you twist your knee, you get this first stage. And in that stage, Age, the body releases all of these cells and they are a signal like a fire alarm signal. Hey, everybody get down here. The second stage is all of these cells arrive and they begin the repair process. So all of these members are here to create scar that over a period of time up to about 12 weeks will gradually form the scar. And all of us know when we cut ourselves, we hope that when the cut on our skin is gone, that nobody knows it was there. So if we then double click on this and say, what happens inside the knee specifically? This, these factors with the blood will release these byproducts. Now, some of them will go on to heal and some of them will go on to cause damage. And what we used to think was inflammation was this thing that started and then it died down. What we now know when we really study this process a little bit more is there is an acute phase right away in the first month or so. Then that gets into a subacute phase. But the thing we didn't really appreciate is between the subacute and the chronic phase, there is very active involvement right then. It's not dying down. There are these cells called specialized pro-resolving mediators, and they're actively engaged. And what we find happens sometimes is you go to perfect resolution. So you take somebody with a knee injury and they live happily ever after. But why is it that sometimes there's this chronic inflammation? Well, this inflammatory process goes awry. And now you have somebody who later on, we call this post-traumatic osteoarthritis. They, that means they, they do fine. They look like they got through their injury. Yet months to years later, all of a sudden their knee starts to wear out and they get difficulties. So one of the exciting parts of this field is recognizing that this is a dynamic process. It goes up, it goes down, it goes up. There's constant input that's happening. And so this gives us an opportunity con to consider, not only do we really have to do something here, we may have to do something here later on. Look at this data from arthritis after ACL reconstruction. These patients were followed, 30% developed OA. And these authors, 
came up with this idea of an inflammatype, which is a subgroup of patients who have these prolonged inflammatory responses. And one of the things I see happening in the future is we will be able to better identify who is going to go on to, to develop a problem and what are the options for what we can do about it. So it goes back to this micro environment idea. The orchestra has to play together to keep all of the factors together. And as I mentioned, there is not a period just at the beginning we have to worry about. We have to worry about the dynamics all the way through this process for many months. And if biological therapy is going to work, it needs to really improve that micro environment, but not just at the beginning. We have to recognize that there is a time-based course to all of this. And we have to figure out how and when do we actually intervene. We also have to recognize that all of us, as we know from just going through life, our tissues don't regenerate at the same capacity at different ages. I will take this 1965 Aston Martin at the top that's been well-maintained over this not well-maintained Porsche 911 Turbo at the bottom that's being carted away. So everyone always says, well, it must be age. No, it, it is age, but it's more than that. What is it that you're gonna do with this? So these are the general options that many of us will hear if we go to see a doctor. So if we look at physical therapy, the main point I wanna convey, when you go to therapy, it's like learning a language. It's not how often did you go, it's what did your body learn? It's teaching your body how do you function efficiently. Medications, we stay away from narcotics in the world of arthritis because there is a very large problem with opioids. And we, if we use anything at all, we consider anti-inflammatories. What is the role of corticosteroid injections? You inject the knee, you lower some of these inflammatory chemicals. The effects seem to go away within about three weeks. We have recent data out of Stanford mainly that shows that these two combinations of anesthetics and corticosteroid together can be toxic to rotator cuff and cartilage tissues. So when the joint's worn out, we don't worry so much. When you're 25 and they're not, we worry a little bit more. There is also an association between getting a corticosteroid and having surgeries later, even up to about 12 weeks. So we always wanna consider the pros and cons of these. Now, how about gel injections? And gel injections are an organic product that we inject in the knee and they can lubricate, they can lower inflammation. There's some binding to the inside cells of the joint as well too, which seems to have joint protective effects. But what about biological therapy, as we talked about? The two points I've mentioned that we really uh, have to focus on are you can get tissue regeneration, you can change the immune system, that micro environment. The three main ones we'll go through briefly are gonna be platelet-rich plasma, mesenchymal stem cells, amniotic membrane. So what is platelet-rich plasma? You take blood, you spin it, you increase the concentration of platelets. That's basically it. When you do this, you poke the platelets, you activate them, you make them release all of their factors and signaling proteins. Again, signaling. So these proteins go out and they do what they need to do. They support healing, they lower inflammation. They will improve the regenerative response. We can apply these to many parts of the body, right? And there has been recent interest in what is the actual makeup of platelet-rich plasma. And we heard a lot in COVID about B cells and T cells, and everyone talked about the immune system. Well, you can actually change the recipe of a platelet-rich plasma injection to modulate the amount of these white cells. And why is that important? Because each of these types of white, white cells or leukocytes, they do something different. So you can increase the amount of leukocytes, you can decrease the amount of it. So how do these actually do? There's so much data and it continues all the time. But the basic answer is we are seeing pain and functional improvements lasting up to 12 months, but it turns out that the amount of white cells and the dose of the platelets matter. Here is what we don't do with platelet-rich plasma injections. We don't regrow cartilage. We don't restore the joint space. We don't take out bone spurs. When we compare PRP, hydroxyapatite, uh, excuse me, hyaluronic acid to corticosteroid injections. When you take hyaluronic acid, which is the gel injections versus PRP, both of those will keep you away from a knee replacement for a longer time. What if you compare PRP to gel injections? Well, PRP does seem to do a little bit better. 
But we're interestingly seeing that when you combine them both, you do even better than that. So the latest answer on this is when you combine platelet-rich plasma with hyaluronic acid injections, that seems to be better than doing the gel alone. If we look at ligament injuries, using platelet-rich plasma seems to be useful, but not in the very beginning after an injury. Now, what about tendon problems? We all have tendon problems. We have tennis elbow, we have other issues, patella tendonitis. Overall, they seem to improve outcomes. They seem to improve outcomes specifically for tennis elbow, maybe for patella tendinopathy, maybe for rotator cuff repair, but the data is variable and it's not fully clear whether it's really worth doing. And one of the things that has been highlighted recently is if you're doing platelet-rich plasma, it may be better a little earlier in the course rather than a lot later. Now, where is this heading to? Well, we can now, as I mentioned, customize these preparations. We take out some of the molecules that we don't want. And at Hospital for Special Surgery in New York, they're even looking at patient metrics. What are the specific biologic parameters? And how do we customize what you need for you? The future is very interesting as far as where this is leading. So, so far, PRP seems to be safe, positive outcomes so far. The recipe is changing where for different problems, we're changing the number of white cells that we're gonna need. And it does seem to be important to have more platelets, to concentrate it further. And as you're gonna hear me say a few times, all of these biologics appear to work better when the amount of arthritis you have is mild to medium. The reactions are pretty minor and most of these are still not covered by insurances. Now stem cells have so much hype and advertising around it. So they can go into many different cell types. They're essentially cells that can turn into anything and they are everywhere. But here's the thing, stem cell therapy is not necessarily injecting stem cells, it's injecting MSCs. What is an MSC? It's a medicinal signaling cells. There are many different terminologies for this too. What basically happens is let's just say you injure yourself, you get a bruise, the body turns on this signal and you release these MSCs and they run around the body to where the problem is, and they go on to make other molecules and other signals that develop the right level of inflammation, and they fix it. And this is a very complicated slide, but essentially these MSCs have sensors themselves, and they have responses depending on what part of the body they are, and they trigger other molecules to do what they need to do at each phase in the body. If you dig around enough, you're gonna see all of these terms. So they can be very confusing. But here are some things to consider. MSCs come from blood vessels. They can be pro-inflammatory, not just anti-inflammatory. One of the interesting newer areas we're seeing is they can really help with chronic pain because they go right to the pain receptors. And they can sometimes even act like an opioid. And they ultimately make these regenerative molecules that can go on to do all the things that they need to do. So when we're doing these type of cell therapies, and I'm only gonna talk about therapy that we're taking from us, they can help tissues heal quicker. The FDA has said, caution, if you're gonna do this, you can't mess around with it. You can't mess around with a recipe. You can take it out, spin it around, but you have to put it back in. And so there are many different contexts for these. Look at how many trials we see moving around. There are lots of trials happening. And so if we start with what we call these mesenchymal cells, the most common way we do this in my practice is we take it from the bone marrow, which means we put a little needle into the pelvis. We can do this awake or asleep with a local anesthetic. We prepare it. We don't get as much as we get older, which is not a big surprise. You don't need a high volume. You only need a little bit because you can get a high volume of these stem cells in a little bit. When you look at basic science models, they seem to help with cartilage healing. They don't seem to help as much when you just squirt it into a joint. But what we do find is that when you put the MSCs in a compartment, they will try to restore the cells that live there. So who is the candidate ideally for this? Mild to moderate osteoarthritis, like I mentioned, will sometimes give a series of injections. How do they stack against cortisone injections, corticosteroid? They're both anti-inflammatory. One supports cartilage repair, the other does not. When we look at uh, the head-to-head -head bone marrow aspirate versus platelet-rich plasma, bone marrow aspirate 
theoretically has more to offer. There's a lot more in them. And there are a lot of trials going on. And what, but when we look at placebo trials, we don't see a lot of difference. We don't see a lot of difference in the cartilage mapping. And my friend Adam did a study in Florida and he had 90 patients who used bone marrow versus platelet-rich plasma it did not find any difference. So all of that to say, if you're going to put your bet on one of these, which one should you go in and get? You might want to consider with a, a PRP for osteoarthritis. And what about those tendon problems I discussed about? I don't think we fully understand what happens. The tendon breaks down. Some people break these tendons down without doing anything. So how do we get that started up again? It turns out there's a biologic signal where tendons start to break down. One of the things we see with these stem cell injections, they may be able to get things back on track, but again, it's not clear. The, the data is variable. We're seeing some positive results in rotator cuff tears, but the bottom line is for osteoarthritis, it's unclear whether there's a benefit there. There may be a benefit in tendon problems. So let's go on to fat-based stem cell treatments. We all hear about these things. The, the, the thing here is that makes the fat uh, cells more appealing is they seem to do a little bit more in theory, but we have to take it from the abdomen. And what we do is we prepare these and then they release their MSCs, as I mentioned. And they seem to be able to even promote cartilage cell growth, perhaps even to a better degree than the bone marrow cells. We can take these from cells inside the knee as well too. And here is an arthroscopic image of what this looks like when we transplant this onto, this is a, an area of cartilage damage inside the knee. So overall, the results seem to be positive in animal models. Now here's the exciting part. When we look at some of these studies from the US and from Europe, there seems to be improvement in osteoarthritis clinical parameters, unlike the bone marrow aspirate up to about two years. And this seems to improve MRIs and the cartilage content of cartilage cells. So overall, we're seeing that even compared to platelet-rich plasma, this seems to be moving the needle a little bit more in the right direction, even for shoulder arthritis, which is a very challenging problem to all of us. It also even looks like it may promote rotator cuff healing. So there's a lot of data happening in this world. Now, when we look at tendon problems, they don't seem to have the same uh, outcomes so far, yet I think the data is still pretty early. And the bottom line is they're safe, positive outcomes. One of the concerns with these adipose-based therapies, for many of them, you have to have a general anesthetic. That can't be fun to do a liposuction with somebody awake or harvest them from the fat cells in your knee awake. So there's more risk potentially involved. Now, going on to amniotic membrane, we all hear about these. They have stem cell characteristics. And so theoretically, there are anti-inflammatory effects and profound growth effects. Look at what amniotic fluid has to do. Look at what amniotic tissue has to do. You're getting a baby to get bigger. So there's a lot of potential for growth. And it may be the richest source of growth factors available. So there is a lot of data happening right now comparing amniotic tissues, they even look here, we have uh, comparing to adipose stem cells, it seems to be superior to adipose stem cells. So this is still a work in progress, but it may improve cartilage growth, tendon healing OA. So, so adipose stem cells, amniotic cells seem to be very, very promising. Now we hear a lot about allograft mesenchymal stem cells. I often hear about it when someone goes to other countries because you can get these where it's a little harder to get in the US. Well, there are some concerns with the reactions in these and how the immune system reacts, even though many of these things may go below the radar. And we can't quite tell about potency. We have no easy way to measure and figure out what we're putting in. So this still remains kind of an unsolved mystery. What are the future directions of where this world is heading? And so this is gonna be a, a whirlwind tour because there's so much happening in this space. Well, there is a cell called an exosome. And these are very tiny particles that also are signaling molecules that are used by some of the other cells that I have mentioned already. And there's a lot of data that is happening right now about what these cells can do. They seem to be, because they're very small, less stimulatory of the immune system. And they seem to be pretty pro-regeneration and anti-inflammatory. They seem to increase cartilage growth in animal models. 
and you can customize them. So you can make them deliver specific cargo. Animal models even suggest that these may be important in the future treatment of osteoarthritis. So there are a lot of labs, some of which I'm aware of, who are looking at the research behind this. This is also very interesting too. How do you control all this data? How do you make it manageable to us as a consumer? Well, there is a group called BARB, and basically they're a collaborative infrastructure looking at how do we make a recipe out of these? How do we figure out what is gonna work for everyone? Because there are so many different variables involved. So I'm very excited to see where this heads in the future. Orthobiologics, things that you can take that are a supplement. The Department of Defense has funded some clinical trials using senolytic agents like fisetin here to see whether you can take it on and off to really improve the symptoms associated with osteoarthritis. So I think there's a lot of data heading. Inducing pluripotent stem cells. That means you take out your old cells and you make them young again and you stick them back in. So again, a very, very interesting potential. We're seeing that in mice models so far. So I don't know where this is gonna go in people. We are also getting better at being able to harvest these MSCs from our blood, from umbilical cord, genetic modifications. We hear about these all the time in different contexts. You can edit a gene, you can engineer it and make it release different factors in different situations. So this is just basic science work, which suggests that you can engineer a cell so that when it's compressed beyond a certain amount, you will now release certain factors, which means I see the day you put these cells in your knee and at a certain amount of loading, you have certain cells that are released. You can even do that in terms of timing. You can take someone where they say they wake up at night or they wake up in the morning and they have a lot of pain and you can get factors to be released based on different times. So it's very interesting where these heading. This is heading, there are a lot of different possibilities. Nanotechnology also is developing in many different directions. This idea of using 3D modeling for cartilage regeneration, very interesting. You make a 3D model of your knee, you make a mold and I'll, some of the things I've just discussed you plant them in the mold and put them in your knee. So there are a lot of interesting options ahead for what we will have to choose from. But what can you do right now, okay? So aging is not gonna stop. So if you be the best version of yourself, you gotta get on the path, which is pay attention to your health. The low hanging fruits are things that everybody hears me say all the time. Yes, we're all excited about biologics but the best way of improving your biology is by doing these four things. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on them, but they're exercise. When you incorporate a full spectrum of exercise and optimize the microenvironment, do various things that stimulate your microenvironment, the body will adapt. But most people don't train at a sufficient intensity to stimulate that adaptive response. So while mobility and stability are very important, Strength training, aerobic exercise in the different zones will stimulate the tissues. And we know that when you do activities like a HIIT training, that you can really liberate your own body stem cell production. Nutrition, people hear about a lot. There's no diet that works for everybody. It's really the patterns that matter. It's not one thing or the other. And the bottom line I would say is anything other than the standard American diet is probably in the right direction, right? Eat real food. If you consider the idea of fasting, when you refeed, it seems that that trigger will set off a signal where your own body's stem cell production or MSCs are now triggered to do some of the things we've just said here. We will often use that in the context of a surgery. When someone is getting ready for a surgery, by nature, you have to fast for eight hours. So I'll tell people, be very careful what you feed yourself after you come back. Your body has got the signals that have been changed. And when you come back and you eat, there is a cell called mTOR. You turn that on and your body now liberates a lot of the factors that I have mentioned here that you can get somewhere else, but you have your own cells turned on. So why would you not want to do that? There's even some data that when you exercise and get yourself to 80% max heart rate on the way to surgery, you are now priming your body 
for having the best possible response. So there are a lot of very basic options that people can do right away without resorting to something that may even be minimally invasive. Don't go right to a supplement. Pay attention to the big things first before you worry about what you're going to put in your mouth. This is Captain Obvious. Sleep is very, very important. As Matt Walker says, that may be the most important thing you can do. There is so much biology and microenvironment that just goes into getting a good night's rest. Why are we mentioning mindset in a talk on biologics? Well, guess what? If you're getting chased by a lion, your sympathetic response is necessary. If you're upset because you have a deadline and your boss is going to yell at you, you are triggering that same response. And that cortisol production is going to shut your body down and lead to a lot of very disorganized uh, biology in your own microenvironment. Doesn't it make sense to start there? Consider the downstream effects of what stress does to us. Ultimately, all of us has to come up with a plan that makes sense for us. Individualize it. Don't try to be a formula. The general recommendations, even though I don't look at this as a formula, this is always a customized plan and a conversation, a shared decision-making process that has to do with the pros and cons. If you are going to consider these, ask your doctor, what are the pros and cons? Is this a good fit for me? Right? Don't look at it as a formula. But with that said, the basic ideas are, if you are just beginning treatment for osteoarthritis, a corticosteroid injection may be considered. The gel hyaluronic acid seems to have less responders with some of the data recently, but when it's effective, it seems to last. I've mentioned platelet-rich plasma. It is growing in terms of the evidence that's supporting its use and osteoarthritis will often do these in a series. In my practice, we'll do these one a week for, for three weeks. We have found that they tend to be better, as I mentioned, as far as long lasting durable relief, even up to a year or two when you combine them with gel. Again, these tend to work better in early osteoarthritis. We'll occasionally use PRP in tendon situations, but we use these carefully. We use these in situations that are not too early, but not too late. Cell therapy, when do we use these? I've occasionally used these in surgical situations. We sometimes use these when the patient's biology is not so good and we need something to add inside there, but I don't think we have enough data and I think we need more data. We also need more data on amniotic fluid. It's still early. There may be some evidence that it works better in conjunction with platelet-rich plasma. So to put all of this into a little ball, the clinical studies are promising. The guidelines are evolving. Most of these are still not insurance covered, but I'm very excited to see where we're going to head. I see the day that this becomes customized. For me, where biologic therapies are going to be most useful is when we can, one, assess the patient. What are the specific factors that are happening in your biology? Can we measure the microenvironment, which we're not so good at? And then how do we customize a cocktail that is gonna give you what you want in conjunction with the four pillars that I just said? If you can do that, I think you will get the most optimal result. Thank you very much. I will now turn it back to Janet, our moderator for any questions.